The seven finalists have seven minutes based on the seven principles on the seventh year of the centre. So a lot of sevens uh, being celebrated here tonight. Uh, and again, just quickly, uh, who has been selected by an international jury from uh, the Institute of Technology, Carlo? And we'll save the applause for the the, the end of the seven rather than each individual one. Andrew McGrennan uh, talking about the Kilkenny Pavilion. Um, we have next, we have the passive entry door by Christopher Fitzgerald from the Cork Centre for Architectural Education. Uh, we have 2020 by Christopher Wallace, Dublin Institute of Technology. We have the information stand by Erica Marquez. Dublin Institute of Technology. Evoke by a team by Michael Murphy, Sean McCooney, Nicholas Murray, Keith Byrne, Ty Dini from Dundalk Institute of Technology. And we've Robbie the Robot from directly across the road from Trinity College Dublin by Connor Lane McGinn. And finally, Liberty Two by Clive Hennessy uh, from University College Dublin. Uh, so they are the, the seven finalists, so a round of applause for, for the seven. Thank you very much. And we second Christopher of the evening, uh, Christopher Wallace from Dublin Institute of Technology and uh, 2020. Right, good evening. Pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Christopher Wallace from DIT, and I'm presenting uh, 2020. So, uh, where did it begin? With a chance encounter. And this was with somebody who uh, suffers from uh, severe uh, blindness. And, and it was really interesting talking with this person and kind of getting a feel for, for how products work and don't work for this person. And, and one of the things that really came across was a level of frustration that with you know, things being labeled as assistive technology, for example, this is a, this is a, a talking watch. And, uh, and it's, 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 it, it, it uh, does its purpose with, uh, without, um, without discretion. It's, it's, uh, it's quite obvious. And uh, so I wanted to try and minimize that. I wanted to try and uh, do something similar to what uh, the iPhone does. Now, uh, what was very interesting about this particular person and, uh, was that she had an incredible ability to use uh, an iPhone. And, and this, for her, was, uh, was, was really, it was a point of pride. And, um, and it was amazing to see how, how she'd become fluent with it. So I wanted to create a similar kind of level of pride and satisfaction in using something that is not typically associated with uh, somebody who... Um, who has a, a, an impairment, um, and to remove the societal differences, uh, to kind of create an equal playing field, and to create something that was truly universal rather than um, somewhat biased, uh, and to do in a similar way as iPhone has done, make the exclusive inclusive. So this is an image of, uh, of my product, um, 2020. And so to describe what it is, it's a timepiece for everybody. Um, and it, uh, it uses visual feedback and tactile feedback. And the most important thing about this is that it's simultaneous and it comes from the same design feature. It's not um, two different elements uh, combined into one uh, to, to create two different outputs of information. Um, and so it, it is equally visual and tactile. Um, and then how to use it. Uh, the time shown here is 10 past 10. So we can read it by uh, the minute dial, uh, shows 10. And then the, uh, the hour dial also shows 10 on the hour. And this is referenced off of the, the, the center ring, which, has, uh, which references the 3, 6, 9, and 12 points with indentations. Uh, and there's, there's, a, there's a surface difference as well. You have, you have the, the different feel of the plastic versus the steel, creating a, a, a difference in, in, in touch. And on the 12, there, there's an extrusion as well, which, um, which kind of gives you a cue as to where the top of the, of the, of the timepiece is. And so flexibility was, was really critical 
to uh, to this whole project, um, and uh, I I came across something interesting. I was analyzing the idea of a wristwatch, and this is this is what's normally known as a watch, and it fundamentally uh, uh, contradicts with principles of universal design. Um, it's located on your wrist because it's easy to see, um, but this this is irrelevant to somebody who uh, who has a visual impairment. Um, so what I've done is, uh, with 2020, create something that can move from your wrist to your pocket or your hand. So it's removable from the, um, from the wristband. And uh, so it can be used, um, for example, on the wrist, if that's how you want to use it, uh, or, or if, um, if you have a visual impairment, you can keep it in your pocket and just you know, touch it or keep it in your hand. But it's also useful for somebody who um, who uh, okay? Um, it's it creates discretion for um, for say a situation like a meeting where it would be rude to uh, check your watch. Just put your hand in your pocket and you know the time. So uh, and then it's based on existing timepieces. So it follows uh, an intuitive pattern that we all know. You know, it's it, it is like a normal clock face. Um, and the familiarity of the form, it has quite a unique form, so over time you'll, you'll, you'll gain like a, an association with this form and, uh, and, and, and it will become like uh, just a simple touch, you, you'll, you'll know instantly where it is and what time it is. So uh, the ease of access was crucial and ease of access uh, physically and, and also uh, from an economic perspective. Um, so firstly, uh, the wristband is flexible. So it's uh, rather than messing around with the clasps and clips, it's very easy to just um, just bend it around your wrist and it stays there, uh, and then bend it back open again. And this is also quite useful for people who have problems with fine motor movement, that sort of thing. And then I'd have different sized timepieces and different sized bands to cater for, uh, for example, children uh, versus male and female timepieces as well. And then the economic differences. There would be f different finishes and different levels of quality for people who, um, who have, uh, for people of different ranges of budgets. Um, so what's next for 2020 is refinement. This has already been presented to uh, Enable Ireland and has received um, uh, positive feedback. So I want to continue that. I want to get more and more feedback. It is only a concept at the moment. So um, some of the finer details need to be worked out. Um, and it can be expanded. We could look at different ways of, uh, of using it in different situations of use. Um, for example, a mount on a wheelchair, or here we have, um, it's, it's on a, there's a timepiece on a, a nurse's pocket. So take inspiration from that kind of thing. And to be attacked. Now, be attacked with a, a positive kind of buzz of energy that's created by this. Like, I want, uh, the best thing that could happen to this project would be for people to come up to me and say, this needs to be made. This, this has to be produced. That would be amazing. And um, really, I think this competition is critical to that. Um, and the market position, if we look at existing timepieces, you have a swatch on the, on the left. And it fits in quite well. Um, and not necessarily with swatch, but um, it, it could be a, a successful timepiece. And on the right, we have a timepiece that is um, is similarly kind of uh, different. So it indicates that the market is not afraid of a watch or a timepiece that is, uh, that is different and unusual, um, that it is acceptable. And so this competition is the facilitator for, for, facilitator for progression. This is, this, is, um, this is how things get brought forward. And this is how I believe this project can be brought forward. Um, if I can speak about it in different places, even about the research that I've done, it would be fantastic, and that's what this competition would do. So, thank you very much.